before we get started this morning. Many of you probably have already heard, but maybe you have not heard. Tomorrow uh, morning, I'll be going in for uh, surgery. I'm having a double knee replacement surgery tomorrow uh, that will put me out for a couple of weeks. And so I say all of that uh, just to ask you, would you just pray for me? Uh, but more than me, will you pray for Stephanie and my family? A um, little bit more concerned about them in the next couple of days uh, and, and taking care of me uh, as I recover. But um, I'm gonna try to do my very best in my, uh, with my personality to, uh, to forget everything that I need to forget and focus on me uh, for a, a couple of weeks as I recover and come back. And who knows? I mean, maybe church softball is back in my future. My wife is shaking her head like, don't you even. Um, but uh, we're gonna continue on in this series this morning. Last week, we started this series called Smoke. And the idea is this, we are uh, evaluating some different aspects or common emotions that we experience throughout our life. The way that these common emotions have an effect or an impact on our spiritual life. Uh, the idea is if there's smoke, then there's usually fire, right? There's a source, there's a, a reason from where we are seeing this after effect of the emotion that we are displaying. And if we can find that source of the smoke, if we can find the source that is causing this emotion that we are dealing with, then hopefully it will allow us to address how, we, how it impacts our everyday life, but ultimately how it impacts our spiritual life. Last week, we started this series and we talked about depression. Let me just say, this led to some very, very good discussion with a number of you last week. I am always honored that you allow me and trust me to be able to walk with you through the different things that you are facing, especially when it comes to something like depression. I'm very thankful that uh, we were able to explore that together and walk through that. And I'm excited about what God is going to kind of unpack for us again today. We're gonna continue on exploring the spiritual impact, but what we need to understand is that just like we said last week with depression, these emotions can also be a part of a physiological or a psychological part of who we are, right? There also may be in past hurt, past experiences that, that kind of bleed over and kind of cause some of these emotions that we feel. The number one thing you need to understand today is it's okay to feel that way. Way. It's okay to know that this emotion is who you are because you have to be able to address it and be able to walk through it. And the only way to do that is to be able to allow that to be out in the open. As I said last week, we believe in counseling, we believe in resources as God-given tools to be able to address this. So what we're going to cover may help you and give you tools that help you to address some of these emotions. But there are also other tools that are available to you that can help you dive deeper and address what these emotions are. And if you are in need of opportunity or where to find those resources, we have those connections to be able to put you in touch with the resources that can be able to help. So today, we're gonna look at anger. Anger is an emotion that we all experience at some level. Uh, anger can be an extremely destructive emotion. Anger is an emotion that's not only difficult for us, but anger is also difficult for those around us, including uh, family, uh, friends, relationships. The people that we value the most are also, also most impacted by anger. Now, now think about this. Many, if not most of us, have probably done or said something in anger that we would like to have back. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay. I just, I just want to make sure that you agree with me out there, right? I'm not the only one that has made, made a mistake at some point and done something in anger, in the heat of the moment that we would like to get back. Like maybe you are just expressing some frustration about a situation or about a person or a group of people to someone else. And somehow that person miraculously walks up behind you right when you're having that conversation. That ever happened to anybody? You want to take that back. Or in today, 
today's day and age, maybe you are just sending a text to a trusted friend. And before you realize you've sent that text to a group of people instead of just the person that you were trying to express your frustration to. That reply all button on your email will get you in a lot of trouble. When someone sends you an email and you wanna go, what are they thinking? I can't believe they want me to do this and that and whatever. And you thought you were just sending it to one person, but you hit that little old reply all button and man, you just can't get that thing back, right? Those are some of those uh, situations that we, we find ourselves in. But you can see uh, that through this process that that feeling of being busted, that feeling of, oh no, that feeling of that sinking feeling of what happens in that moment is what anger can do. It's what anger can do to us. Anger has a way of damaging relationships. Anger has a way uh, of, of getting folks fired. <laughs> anger has a way uh, of keeping you from getting the job or performing what you want to, to perform or do. Anger can cause you to do things that have major consequences and bring big time punishments. That's what anger does. And sometimes we think of anger as only like these big angry outbursts, like that's what anger is. No, no, no. Some of you don't have anger that's a big angry outburst. Some of you have different forms of anger like the cold shoulder or the silent treatment. You have different ways that you express your anger. So maybe you're, you're so angry that you just hang on to this bitterness because of this situation that you have walked through. You respond in sarcasm to the person that you are having a conversation with and, and this person that's there. And many times you get so angry in today's world that the ultimate is that you unadd or delete them from your social media platform. <laughs> oh. The tragedy, but in essence, it is hurtful and angry because what you are saying in that moment is you are no longer worthy to be a part of my life. You are no longer worthy to, to see what is important to me anymore. I have nothing to do with you. And it may seem small, but it creates this internal anger. No matter the reaction of the anger that you have, what anger does is it creates distance. When we have anger in us, we are creating distance. We are creating separation. It, it creates this disdain for the other person. And this distance from that person is, is even more, it's not just distance from them, but it's distance from everybody that they feel is important. Distance from family members because of the anger that you have. Distance from others that we associate with. We're so angry that we just cut ties. I, I just, I, I've seen so many people get so angry at things in the church because something didn't happen the way that they liked it to happen or there was a decision that happened. And they're so quick to abandon friends and relationships that have not only lived into them, but they have lived into for so long because anger sneaks in. We often downplay anger and frustration because we don't like to admit it. Most of us came in this morning are like, depression, good, wanted to talk about that. Anger, not me. I don't deal with anger. Not true. Anger is something that we all have to battle, but typically we downplay it and we say things like, I'm not angry, I'm just frustrated. Why, why can't I just have a bad day? Everybody else has a bad day. I guess you never made a mistake. I guess I'm the only one that ever made a mistake. You're just being too sensitive today. Don't you just understand? I'm just telling the truth the way it is. I, I'm, I'm just tired of always being the one that has to apologize. I'm tired of being the one that always has to say that I'm sorry. Can't you be sorry? Or look, I just needed to vent. All of those emotions are downplayed into what is happening when we allow anger to be an issue that we have to address. So we're gonna understand this morning or unpack a little bit about how our anger is slowly destroying us in ways that we often don't even know. We're gonna look in Ephesians chapter four at what it says about anger. Now, I want you to know as we follow along today or we open to Ephesians chapter four, I feel like Ephesians chapter four could have easily been written for our culture today. As we read through this today, listen, our culture is angry. Our culture is angry. 
We're angry about a number of things. Everybody is angry about something. It could be the exact same issue, but if you're on this side, you're angry for this reason. If you're on this side, you're angry for this reason. And we're both just angry at each other. People are angry on the road. I mean, people have lost their minds driving a vehicle because of how angry they are about where they need to go. If you don't believe me, get on I-24 tomorrow morning and you will see anger or try to take a left turn in Nolensville. People lose their minds. People are angry at the grocery store checkout girl because she's not going fast enough. People are angry because the service is taking too long at the, at the restaurant that they're at. People are angry about something on the Nolensville 411 or the Hip Smyrna social media page every single day. And I don't even understand why. But our culture is dealing with a deep emotion of anger. So that's why when I read these words from Paul, I feel like they are extremely relevant to the world that we find ourselves living in today. Look what it says, uh, starting in 26. It says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. I think it's interesting at the beginning of what's happening here in this passage, it says, in your anger, don't sin. There's an understanding that anger will happen. See, we've grown up with this idea, or maybe we were told that we should just eliminate all anger, that the closer to God, the less angry we would be. But that's not what's happening in this moment. It's saying that anger is going to happen. There are times that, in fact, we can be angry, and there are times that we actually should be angry. Here's what anger does. Anger is a destructive energy in defense of something that you love. That's where the anger is coming from. It's defending something. So like when someone has cancer that you love, you are angry at the cancer. You are angry at the situation that they are in and where they're going through. And it's okay to be angry at the cancer. We get angry as parents because we love our kids so much that we get angry at the things that are trying to harm and manipulate them and change them and pull them away from the kingdom of God. And it's okay to be angry at those things. In fact, Jesus himself got angry. A few passages that talk about Jesus' anger. It says uh, in Mark, it says, another time Jesus went to the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is unlawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. The Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians that they might kill Jesus. Jesus was angry because they cared more about their customs and the way things had always been than they did about the person that was right in front of them. And it angered Christ. They weren't willing to adapt to the situation that was happening. They simply wanted to just go by the letter of the law and they were consumed and concerned about what the rules said. But Jesus's anger 
was coming from a defense of this man that he loved, even a man that he had not met before, but had a deep love for. Now, we all love this story that's in Matthew 21. We use this one to our advantage all the time. Jesus entered the temple courts. He drove out all who were buying and selling there, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling the doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Every time we get a little bit angry, we're like, even Jesus flipped some tables. Listen, <laughs> that's not what's happening in this moment. What's happening in this moment is this area that they had set up shop in was designated and designed for the sick and hurting in the temple. But once again, selfishly, they had pushed out those that were in need in order to do something for themselves. They kicked out the hurting so they could fulfill their own greed. So before you think that this gives us a green light to go out there and start flipping tables or going to Facebook to right all the wrongs of the world in the way that we see them, remember that none of us have the clarity and understanding of Jesus. We don't possess that. In fact, we say it all the time, he is God and we are not. And we use that as peace for us in many times that he is God, we are not, he is in control. But maybe as we begin to have that little outburst of anger or to tell him like it is, maybe we should remember he is God and we are not in that moment. Now, as Christians, there are times that we should be angry. We should be angry at some of the things that are, are happening in our world, in our community, in our culture. We should be angry at people that are being taken advantage of. We should be angry at people that are being persecuted or abandoned or unfairly treated. In the same way as we should be angry, it's also not okay to stand by and not get angry when things happen to somebody else but don't directly happen to us. It's not okay to just ignore it because it doesn't directly impact me. Church, that's where we're getting it wrong. We have to stand in the gap for somebody else that is being wronged, even if they, they don't look or speak or say or do the things that we do. Those things should make us as followers of Christ angry because I think there are things that are happening in this world today that would make Jesus angry, that he would not be happy with, he would not be pleased with. But then this passage also says in Ephesians, it says in that anger, that anger that's gonna happen, in that anger, don't sin. Whew. How do we do that? If we're supposed to be angry and anger is this emotion, then how do we not sin in that anger? Well, it starts with asking that question that we just unpacked. What is your anger defending? What is it that you're defending? See, there is a righteous anger and there's a sinful anger, a destructive anger. That sinful anger comes from defending the wrong things or sometimes defending the right things in the wrong order. If your anger is selfishly motivated, you have to ask yourself that question. Why am I angry? What am I defending? Is it because I'm defending it selfishly is it motivated by what's impacting you or is it motivated by what's impacting other people? Is your anger coming from a concern from others? Like when I get angry at that person that passes me on the shoulder on the exit ramp and goes flying by and I get super angry, that's on me. I'm not concerned and angry because they may be, you know, needed. I'm angry because it impacts me. How dare they get in front of me? How dare they skip me? What makes them better than me? Why do they have the right to do this in front of me? It's all about me. That is an unrighteous, destructive kind of anger. Paul gives us some clues on how we can eliminate that destructive anger in verse 24. And then again in 31 through 32, he says, put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Then he says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. The only way to let go of bitterness and rage, and slander and anger that we deal with is to be made new, 
to be made more like Jesus. We say that every day. If we try to just stop being angry on our own, it just ain't gonna work. If you feel like you have the power to just, to just stop anger, I'm here to tell you that it won't happen. We have to continue to battle that anger and to continue to battle it, we have to allow ourselves to be made new in Christ so we can eliminate that destructive anger. There are a couple ways we can do that. First is this, we need to remember that we are first sinners and secondly, we are sinned against. What does that mean? Well, it means in this relationship that we have with God, number one, we will be sinned against. Someone will wrong you. Someone will do things that, that are out of line. Someone will do things that, that justifiably they should not do. And when that happens against you and when they wrong you, typically our first response is a destructive type of anger. How dare they? I'm gonna pay them back for, the anger, for, for what they have done to me. But when we remember that we are the ones that are guilty first, we are the ones that, that first sinned, we have this understanding that there's nothing that anybody that can do to us or say to us or any way that they can treat us that would be possibly worse than the way that we treated God. And yet what was his response? To forgive. He first forgave us. So he displayed that love and, and he wasn't angry with us, but he displayed a love and a forgiveness. I think one of the hardest struggles in the church, all the way back from the time of Pharisees that we're talking about in this scripture today, all the way till now, is the hypocrisy of ignoring our own sin while focusing on the sin of somebody else. We are quick to point out what you did wrong. We are quick to point out why you made me angry. We are quick to point out why you should be distanced from God. And we often forget to look at our own selves first the church would be a healthier place. If we address every issue that we understood and, and every encounter that we had with this, this grace and understanding, I was first wrong. I deal with these situations. They may not be the same, but how dare I point to your sin without recognizing or understanding the sin in my own life? In verse 26, uh, we, we've all seen this line. And maybe, maybe you have repeated this line. Maybe you have used it to gain advantage in an argument at some time or another. The line that says, don't let, your, don't let the sun go down on your anger, right? Like we've been in that, that argument or that conversation. This, this doesn't mean stay up all night until we resolve conflict. I know we've been told that, but that's not true. So I heard an amen and I think it was from a wife. Um, listen, we, 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 don't, we don't have to stay up all night long and, and wait until we completely erase conflict. That's not what it meant. It's not meant to wear down your spouse until they wave a white flag and you win the battle or the argument. That's not what this passage means. What it actually means is an acknowledgement that if your anger is righteous or it's a healthy kind of anger, then you can sleep peacefully at night knowing that God's got this. We can let go, we can, we can go to sleep, we can know that he's in control and we don't have to worry and we don't have to wonder about these things that have made us angry. However, if your anger does keep you up at night, if you lie there thinking about what you should have said, what you wanted to say, what you will say the next time, if you lose sleep over what was done to you, if it's consuming you, if it's in your dreams, most likely that's a destructive type of anger. It's an anger that, is, that has caused this separation. So how do we keep our anger limited to this healthy, righteous kind of anger, a, a Jesus-like anger? Understand this, loving anger is redemptive, not vindictive. Loving anger should be directed at the problem and not the person. There's the difference in these two types of anger, one that is a healthy anger that we will experience and one that is a destructive anger that is destroying us from the inside out. It's not about accusations and it's not about you being the one that gets to be the, the judge and the, the jury and, and decide what justice needs to happen. It's not about assigning blame. It should be an invitation to reconciliation. If your anger is an attempt to, to be an invitation to reconciliation, you're on the right track of a, a healthier 
type of anger. Anger is not about who's right and wrong. Anger is about restoring the relationship. Here's how we know. Loving anger is this. Loving anger is short-lived. Loving anger is when we address it, it made us angry, but we address it in this loving way without blame, without selfishness, with the intent of restoring the relationship. Our anger shouldn't persist, but it should end in that moment. Done. Address the anger, be over, move through it. If our anger continues, if we're carrying our anger for years and years and years, if we just can't get over that time that we were wrong or it made us angry, it is likely that it is a destructive anger that is destroying us. Loving anger is also controlled. It said in, in 31, it said, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. See, destructive anger is loud, like the rage and the brawling that's described. But it's also passive aggressive, like slander to those that we're angry with. Loving anger does the opposite. In Matthew 21, it says, this is what happens after Jesus flipped those tables. After Jesus flipped those tables that we like to go to and talk about all this anger, right after he flipped those tables, it says, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. After this angry outburst, the vulnerable come to Jesus. When you get angry, do people come to you or do they stay out of your way? Man, he is in a mood today. Steer clear. Man, I don't know what's going on with her today, but not gonna be there. I'm gonna get out of the way. Do your, your kids or your spouse, after an angry outburst, do they go to their room? Do they close the door? Do they flee the situation? Those are signs of destructive anger at work. This healthy anger that Christ had, it happened and people were drawn to him. Often this anger that we have is one that causes separation and pushes others away. Through all this, we see this. Anger is going to happen. You're not just gonna be able to eliminate it. You're not gonna just be able to go through the rest of your days without anger. But there's a righteous anger and a destructive anger. Most of the time, our anger is in hopes that there could be a change, that what we're defending will bring about a change, a change in a person, a change in a situation because we don't like it or we don't see the, the, the fairness might not even be the right word, but it, it's just not right. Can I tell you that if we wanna bring restoration in a relationship about something that makes you angry, it's only going to happen through grace. It's only going to happen through this acceptance and this, this relationship of, of resolution. If resolution is our objective, then we have to offer grace and not this outburst of anger. God is continually described in the scripture as what? Slow to anger, slow to anger. There were times when God was angry throughout the scripture, but there was a lot that had to happen before that anger was there. And then when it was, it was a healthy anger that sought restoration and healing and not one that sought division and divide. In the same way, if someone you love is angry, destructively angry, you need to let them know that they're angry. See, when we talk about depression, depression is something that we all sit there and understand, I feel depressed. I feel that feeling. I know what that emotion feels like. But anger often doesn't do that. Anger often has more an effect on other people around us than we recognize for ourselves. And it takes someone that you love in your life to reach out and say, hey, this anger that you're dealing with, I think it's causing a, a divide and a distance between you and the Father as much as it is causing a divide between people that you love. 
those that deal with anger need that loving reminder. If someone tells you that maybe you're dealing with some anger or you have an anger problem, I promise you your first response is to get angry. <laughs> My challenge to you would be this. If lovingly someone says, can we talk about maybe what Pastor Jason talked about today? Can we, can we talk about anger and maybe the reactions and the ways that, that you react and, and what that might be? My challenge to you today would be to wait two minutes before you respond. <laughs> Put it on the clock. If somebody says, let's talk about your anger, I want you to wait two whole minutes. And then I want you to begin that conversation of what steps can be taken for you to eliminate this destructive anger. See, God wants us to eliminate that destructive anger. And I know that it sounds like a dream. It sounds unreasonable. But what we need to understand is that more than those that are around us, that love us, are affected by anger, the person that is angry is the most affected by the anger. The one that is experiencing that anger is the one that is, that is dealing with and trying to overcome this destructive anger that maybe they don't even know have. God's not giving us an impossible task. He's trying to offer us freedom and peace that we don't even know that we need. So accept his peace, accept his freedom and experience the joy that is possible. Create that restoration and that resolution with him and with those that we love and live with. Will you pray with me this morning? Stand with me where you're at. Heavenly God, we, we love you so much this morning. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, just be with us as we continue to explore these motions over the next few weeks, how we address how you desire for us to, to understand where these emotions are coming from and realize that these emotions are not just habits that we have or, or things that we deal with here in an earthly situation, but that they have spiritual impacts on us and that we have the opportunity to begin to address them through your word and your way and through any other opportunity that you provide for us to find this healing and restoration so that we can understand the love and the joy and the peace that you promise us, God. That's your desire, that we would live in unity with you, understanding of you, and ultimately daily, one day at a time, look more like you tomorrow than we did today. Pray this in your son, Jesus Christ's name and all my family said.